Today we got a really interesting one that I think is going to – it's probably going to blow my mind. I, I, it's, I, I told my wife earlier, I'm kind of like, boy, I, I got to really psych myself up for this because I think it's going to be a little bit over my head in a way, but in a good way, really, truly in a you good way. We're, we're, well, I, I say that, I know, but, but we're talking today about the absolute primacy of Christ, and this is it, – it's going to kind of get into the – I mean, I guess the Franciscan versus Thomistic um, ideas of of the incarnation. It's it's a really really fascinating topic, and it's one that that I think is going to be valuable for everyone. This is Daniel. He's my guest, and it, before anyone asks, no, Daniel, he's not a priest. He's not a cleric, but he does come with the high recommendation of a priest that I trust very much, and so thus I trust Daniel. So let's keep that in mind. Um, Again, though, we are both laymen, but I know that Daniel, because Daniel sent me quite a few slides, that he has done his research, and this is based on um, church teaching and, and the quotes of the church, etc. So, Daniel, um, I don't have a whole lot much more to say for an intro, so so I'm going to send it to you. I mean, wh- what are we talking about today? Okay, so uh, just to build off what you said, another thing is just, uh, I, yeah, I'm no cleric in any way. I am a third order of Franciscan, and so Father Francis um, Miller, who's my superior, also well, uh, told give me you know a permission to speak about this particular Perfect. topic. So, um, if you don't mind, can we start with it before I explain it? Can we start with just a quick prayer? I need please, to grace. absolutely, right. yeah. Right. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created. Thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who does illumine the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant us in that same spirit to be truly wise and never to rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. St. Francis, pray for us. Pray for us. St. Maximus, the confessor, pray for us. Mother of perpetual help, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, okay, I'm just going to read an opening statement here um, because it'll be a little better than going off the cuff. So when we talk about the absolute primacy of Jesus Christ, all schools of theology assign to Christ a certain primacy, uh, a primacy of honor, dignity, glory, grace, power, and majesty above all else in creation. So what then is meant by the absolute primacy of Christ? The absolute primacy of Christ, sometimes known as the universal primacy of Christ or simply the Franciscan thesis, is a theological position defended primarily by the Franciscan order following blessed John Duns Scotus. It is denied by those who assign to Christ a merely relative primacy, primarily the Dominican order following St. Thomas Aquinas. The Franciscan thesis can be summarized as follows. God, infinitely perfect and happy in himself, freely wills from all eternity to manifest himself and receive extrinsic glory by means of creating. The incarnation, which both glorifies God and manifests his perfections to an infinite degree, is the first object of God's creative will in such a way that all else in creation is willed for the sake of Jesus Christ, while he himself is willed independently of and logically prior to all else in creation. Even as the mineral kingdom, which possesses the good of existence, was willed by God for the sake of the plant kingdom, which possesses both existence and life, and as the plant kingdom was willed for the sake of the animal kingdom, which possesses existence, life, and the principle of motion, And as the animal kingdom was in turn willed for the sake of man, who adds to all of these perfections that of a rational soul, so all of the members of each of these kingdoms and all nine choirs of angels besides were willed by God for the sake of the God-man Jesus Christ, who possesses all of these perfections eminently and assumes them into his divine person. As St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 22 through 23, all things are yours, whether it be Paul or Apollo or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come. For all are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. The Thomistic thesis, in turn, views the Incarnation primarily as a remedy for sin. Far from being willed antecedently to and independently of all else in creation, Jesus Christ within this system is a purely occasioned good, a good whose existence was occasioned by Adam's sin. To quote St. Thomas himself, quote, If man had not sinned, the Son of Man would not have come. The Thomistic thesis can be summarized as follows. God, infinitely perfect and happy in himself, freely wills from all eternity to manifest himself and receive extrinsic glory by means of creating. God first wills the angels, then man, then the animal, plant, and mineral kingdoms. Foreseeing that man will fall into sin, God wills to become incarnate principally as a means of redeeming man from sin by rendering infinite satisfaction through his death on the cross. In this system, Christ Jesus, the God-man, was willed for our sake, rather than we for his. Our position in this matter, then, far from a mere obscure academic notion, will frame our view of creation, redemption, grace, 
predestination, justification, and most importantly, Jesus Christ himself. Indeed, the only Christian mystery untouched by this matter is that of the Blessed Trinity itself. Uh, for this reason, the absolute primacy of Christ is rightly called the foundation stone of the entire edifice of Franciscan spirituality. Uh, to, I'm just going to read a quote here from St. Maximus the Confessor. He wrote this in the early 600s. He's a church father. Quote, Christ is that great and hidden mystery. This is that blessed end for which all things were created. This is the divine scope foreknown before the beginning of creatures, which we define to be the end that was foreknown, on account of which all things exist, but itself exists on account of nothing. With this end in view, God produced the essences of creatures. This is properly the end of providence and the things foreknown. This is the mystery that contains all the ages and that manifests the great plan of God, which is infinite, and which pre-existed the ages in an infinite manner. Really, it was for the sake of Christ that all the ages and the things in the ages themselves received the beginning and the end of existence in Christ. This hypostatic union was made when Christ appeared in the last times. By itself, it is the fulfillment of the foreknowledge of God. And so that's uh, just a, a little outline of the two positions there. And um, if you don't mind, I just wanted to read a couple of disclaimers here. The first thing is that this is an area of free opinion and theology, so you can you're free to accept this or reject it. Um, there are different positions given by different theologians. You're not free to make your your own wild opinion, but you can accept uh, those that are legitimate. Um, another thing is that I'm not going to be speaking about some of the variant opinions. So in the Thomistic uh, view, there's a central concept that I'll explain. I'm not going to discuss the variations of Cardinal Cajetan, the Carmelites in Salamanca, or the modern, the Neo-Thomists like Father Gerigo Lagrange. Um, I'll just explain the general more common opinion. And the same goes with um, the Scotistic opinion. I won't, exp I won't go into the different uh, varieties and I won't discuss the third ways of Suarez or Roschini or these other people. Um, and that's basically because they can all be reduced to these two that I'll be discussing anyway, if, if you really want to get into them. So, um, and another thing here is that um, we're going to be discussing the divine plan of creation. So God is absolutely simple. And as such, his plan is one simple decree. Uh, nonetheless, because creation is perfectly ordered, uh, some things are willed for the sake of others. Uh, for instance, plants and animals exist for mankind. Mankind doesn't exist for the sake of plants and animals. And so therefore, in order to speak intelligently about the order of God's creation, uh, it's universally accepted by theologians that we have to speak of some things being willed first, some things being willed second, third. We're not, uh, we're not saying that God... Uh, he has a succession of acts or that he changes, mm -hmm. but rather just that some things are, there's a causality to it. So, mm -hmm. um, and one final thing is that you're going to hear me reference uh, blessed John Duns Scotus throughout the podcast. And some might object that Duns Scotus was beatified by John Paul II, whose papacy we don't recognize. Uh, but when I call him blessed, I'm not invoking this attempted beatification. I'm rather blessed John Duns Scotus has been referred to as blessed by the Franciscans for a very long time. Uh, he's called blessed in official prayer books of the order, theological works, and even in the martyrology of the order, which uh, Franciscans are, are bound under pain of sin to recite in, in choir, right? So um, it's a colloquial title. I encourage you to use it because it references his holiness, and it's uh, very traditional. So mm -hmm. so the first thing here is uh, what what is the question we're asking? So it's the state of the question. There's different ways that people have phrased the question. Um, the most popular became popular because of St. Thomas, but it really comes from St. Augustine, and that is, if Adam had not sinned, would the Son of God have become incarnate? Now, I'm going to not use that question. The reason is that it's a hypothetical question. So it's, you're asking, in some other possible world, if Adam didn't sin, what would happen? Mm -hmm. Well, God only reveals what he actually did uh, will to happen. He only reveals uh, his actual plan of creation. So we can't, strictly speaking, answer that question. Uh, we could arrive at a conclusion, but... Uh, it's better to ask about our current order of um, of creation. So um, Scotus changes the, the question. He asks, does the predestination of Christ necessarily presuppose the fall of human nature? And so by putting it in the frame of predestination, um, it narrows the scope. So you're not talking about all these different things. You're talking about predestination. Plus, all theologians at that time agreed on how predestination worked. So it, it made it a little easier to discuss. And also, it's it's based in the current order of creation. Um, but we're not going to use that either. Um, St. Bonaventure, uh, in the days of St. Thomas, 
he asked, what is the primary reason for the incarnation? And this is great because it's simple. It's not hypothetical. Um, the only problem with it is that it's not specific enough because if, I, if we're asking what is the primary reason, in theology, reason is basically identical with the word cause. And so when we ask what's the cause of something, there's different causes. There's uh, the, there, it could be the final cause, the efficient cause, the exemplary cause. So we need to be a little more specific. Um, and so we're going to use the question, what is, this is a technical question, what is the primary, proximate, final cause of the incarnation? Sounds weird. It's a 25 cent word. But uh, what it, when we say final cause, we're just indicating the goal that one has in mind uh, when willing a particular thing. So, you know, uh, we will to make this podcast, hopefully to edify people. Okay, the final cause is the edification, let's say, of the, of the faithful. Okay, um, so we're asking, what is God's goal in taking flesh? And when we say proximate, we're saying not the remote final cause, but the proximate. Because the remote final cause of all of creation is identical. It's the glory of God. So we're asking specific, more specifically. So in simple terms, when we ask, what is the primary proximate final cause of the incarnation? We're asking... What specific primary goal does God have in mind in becoming man? And so that's the question we'll use. So far, so good. You got any questions for me? No. Nope. Okay. Got it. Okay. So first we'll discuss the two masters here. So we'll start with St. Thomas and then we'll go to Blessed John Ben Scotus. So St. Thomas is going to say that God wills the incarnation primarily as a means to bring about the redemption of fallen man. Thus, uh, man's redemption from sin can be called the proximate final cause of the incarnation. Uh, if man had not sinned, the word would not have taken flesh. Uh, can you pull up slide one for me? Maybe. Come on. Okay, there. so here's the argument. Um, this is the primary argument. Uh, Gary Lagrange says that this can, that all of the arguments of St. Thomas can be reduced to this, so it's a good one to use. Um, so what depends solely on the will of God can be made known to us only in as much as it is contained in sacred scripture. We're all ready to admit that. Uh, but everywhere in sacred scripture, the sin of the first man is assigned as the reason for the incarnation. Therefore, it's more convenient to say that the sin of the first man is the reason for the incarnation. So I want you to note here that the minor of this argument, that's number two on the slide, it states that, quote, everywhere in sacred scripture, the sin of the first man is assigned as the reason for the incarnation. So that's a, that's an overstatement. And this overstatement of the case makes it really easy to disprove this, just because if I can show you a single place in Scripture that sin is not the primary reason for the Incarnation, then that argument is, is destroyed. Mm -hmm. And as we'll see, there are many such passages. So um, note also that St. Thomas himself stated that in number three on the slide that this opinion was merely convenientior or more convenient than the other opinion. Uh, and so he explicitly also admitted the opposite position was probable. Now, later, Thomas deny this, and they say that the Thomistic position is theologically certain, because they, they, the, the schools kind of dig in their heels uh, based on what their founder's opinion is. But um, St. Thomas is open for discussion here. Now, um, so St. Thomas is basically in the essentials. He's following St. Anselm. And so what he's asserting is that sin is, in a certain sense, infinite, um, and because it's an offense against the infinite God. Now, to repair an infinite outrage, uh, an infinite expiation is necessary. So God in his mercy freely wills that man be freed from his infinite guilt. And since man cannot offer infinite satisfaction, God decrees that he himself will take flesh in order to offer a propitiatory sacrifice of his own life and a perfect atonement for sin. Thus, redemption from sin is the proximate final cause of the incarnation. Um, now, note here that that thesis presupposes first an infinite malice of sin, which is debatable, um, but also the necessity of infinite expiation to warrant God's forgiveness. Um, however, God, uh, he's the only one that's wronged by sin. So he can freely forgive without demanding any satisfaction whatsoever, if he so pleases. And this would not violate his justice in any way. So in, in the same way, Kevin, if I were to steal something from you uh, and I didn't harm anyone else in the process, you could freely choose to forgive me without demanding any expiation, any reparation at all. And you wouldn't be unjust. You'd be merciful, right? And so in the same way, God, since he's uh, the ultimate, there's no law above him whatsoever, um, he, he could do the same thing and he wouldn't be violating justice. And it's also worth noting um, that those principles are taken directly from St. Thomas himself. So it's important um, because it means that the redemption is not what's called an adequate cause of the incarnation. 
In other words, the goal of man's redemption does not demand the incarnation as a means. It's not an adequate uh, cause. Uh, because man's redemption could be achieved by a finite expiation or no expiation whatsoever. So man's redemption is a finite good, while the incarnation is an infinite good. Uh, if the incarnation is principally willed as a means to bring about the redemption of man, then the means infinitely overshoots the end desired. And that's not fitting for the infinite wisdom of God, or at least that's what, what Scotus would contend. Um, so if there is, in fact, an adequate cause of the incarnation— a goal which no one but the God-man can possibly achieve, then we must admit that such a cause is the principal and proportional reason for which God decreed the Incarnation. Now, we have such an adequate cause, namely the infinite love, honor, and glory rendered to God by Jesus Christ himself. That infinite extrinsic glory, uh, that is, glory outside of God himself, could not possibly be achieved in any other way but through the hypostatic union of the divine and human natures in one divine person, Jesus Christ. Now, God wills to receive this infinite love. We know that because it's, he did receive it. Uh, and since it can be achieved by no other possible means but the Incarnation, we must confess that this is the primary final cause or reason for the Incarnation, and not the redemption, which God could have achieved by a much lesser means, if he so chose. So, Next, we'll discuss uh, Blessed John Scotus' opinion. <clears throat> so he's going to say that the proximate final cause of the Incarnation is the infinite love which Christ will render to God. The Incarnation is the very first thing decreed by God outside of himself, and therefore all else depends on him, while he depends on nothing created. Therefore, he would have become incarnate regardless of Adam's sin. Um, and if you can pull up slide two for me, Kevin. Okay, so... God first predestines, uh, this is, sorry, this is the argument for predestination. So God first predestines an elect soul to glory and subsequently wills and permits all circumstances which lead said soul to glory. Now this, this is um, contested now, but at the time it was not. And um, St. Saint Thomas and the Thomas would readily agree to this statement. All it means is that God chooses a soul. He says, I want this soul to be in heaven. I'm going to infallibly give him the means to arrive at heaven. I'll give him the graces that will infallibly lead him to heaven. And so uh, he also, so first he wills the soul to, to end up in heaven in glory, and then he wills positively and permits uh, all the circumstances that will lead him there. So in other words, all of the merits and demerits of the person are, are viewed by God after he elects the soul to glory. Okay. Now, number two says, but Christ is the first of the elect in whom all others are predestined. And that's a fact from sacred scripture. So then, therefore, Christ's predestination is anterior to any consideration of merit or demerit, and thus cannot be contingent upon Adam's sin. So because predestination goes first, God is predestining them to the glory, and then he foresees uh, good works and evil works, uh, merit and demerit, and because Christ was the first, then he was destined to glory before God considered anyone's sin or merit, and so definitely before Adam's sin. Um, so that's a, a strong argument. And if you can pull up um, slide three, we'll go into uh, another argument. This argument will take a couple slides to, to get through because it has a, it'll have a couple, um, a couple things to go through. So note here that the word end is the same thing as final cause, what we discussed earlier. So uh, first, he who wills in an orderly manner wills first that which is closest to the end. Uh, it sounds maybe a little confusing. All it means, like, if I'm um, if I need to fill up gas for my car, the the first thing I will, okay, I will to get gas for my car. Then I will, okay, I have to go to the gas station. Well, how do I get to the gas station? I got to get in my car and drive to the gas station. So, first I will the goal, and then I will the things that lead to the goal, mm -hmm. um, in a, in an inverse uh, way to the to the to the execution. So, number two says. Uh, or rather B, says, but God wills in a most orderly manner. So therefore, God wills first that which is closest to the end. Okay? And mm -hmm. slide four will take that, that conclusion and, and use it. So the end of all creation is the extrinsic glory of God and the communication of his perfections. No one would disagree with that. It's dogma. Um, but Christ Jesus alone glorifies God and manifests his perfections to an infinite degree. Therefore, Christ Jesus is the closest thing to the end of all creation. And then if you go to slide five, we'll wrap those two together. So God wills first that which is closest to the end. 
but the incarnation is the closest thing to the end of all creation. Therefore, God wills the incarnation prior to and independently of the rest of creation, and a fortiori prior to Adam's sin. This is another very strong argument. It's very Franciscan because it centers on the will. And, uh, well, we don't have time to discuss that, but the will is uh, very essential to the Franciscan position of, of everything. So, but practically speaking, I think if we look at that same argument in terms not of, um, of the will so much, but in terms of love, it'll kind of drive it home. Because we have to remember that God's will is identical with his love. And so God knows all possible things that could exist. But only those things that he loves actually come into being. He wills them. He loves them into being. So he literally loves us into existence. And so when we say that God wills one thing for the sake of another, we we'll love that thing for the sake of another. Now, to love something greater for the sake of something lesser is disordered. So, for example, uh, the virtue of charity. It's uh, an infused habit by which we love God above all things and love our neighbor as ourselves for the sake of God. Now, if I were to love God for the sake of my neighbor, I would have a disordered love, and it would not be charity. Uh, that's because I'd be loving the greater good for the sake of a lesser good. Uh, another example, uh, do you have pets at all? No. Okay. Well, if you had, let's let's imagine you had a pet. Okay. Normal. Uh, it's normal for someone to have a certain love for their their dog, right? They, you know, maybe they get a dog for their their daughter, uh, and so they have a certain love for their their pet. But they're loving the pet for the sake of the family, right? But if someone were to tell me that they love their family for the sake of their pet, it would be disordered. Um, in, the, in this world today, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh boy, it's a disordered world, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Most of those people probably don't have families, but uh, you know, fair enough. But the reason that's disordered is, again, they love the greater good for the sake of a lesser good. So it's a, mm. it's a perversion of things. So um, Now, God knows the absolute value of everything. So if we say that God wills Christ an infinite good, primarily for the sake of man, who is a finite good, we're saying that he loves Jesus Christ. He loves uh, Jesus Christ for the sake of man. And this is to attribute to God a disordered love, so because he would be loving a greater good for the sake of a lesser. And this would be a love infinitely more disproportionate and disordered than loving one's family for the sake of one's dog, because the distance between the goodness of man and that of Christ is infinitely greater than the distance between the goodness of a dog and someone's family. Um, so for Scotus, that's unthinkable, absolutely unthinkable. Um, and I'll read the following quote. It's a, uh, fam it's a summary uh, of Blessed John Don Scotus' teaching on the primacy. Uh, it's on slide six. It's, it's really good for meditation, but I'm not going to dwell on it because it, it's it's kind of difficult. But I encourage you to think about it. Um, our listeners can maybe pause and think it over. Uh, I'll read it. Therefore, I declare the following. First, God loves himself. Secondly, he loves himself for others. And this is an ordered love. Thirdly, he wishes to be loved by him who can love him with the greatest love. Speaking of the love of someone who is extrinsic to himself. And fourthly, he foresees the union of that nature that must love him with the greatest love even if no one had fallen. And so thus, for Scotus, uh, true to his Franciscan roots, the entire order of creation is to be found in the love and free will of God. Uh, Christ is primarily the well-beloved son of God, and only secondarily is he the redeemer of man. Um, so do you have any questions with any of that stuff? Oh, I think the only thing that's popped into my head, I mean, it's all, it's, 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 I'm going to have to listen to this a couple of times, you know, or soak sure, it in by, sure. uh, by osmosis. But I mean, my <laughs> one question would be, um, when, when did Scotus live? Was he around the same time as um, Blessed Scotus? Was it the same time as St. Thomas around the same time? He was, he was basically the, the generation immediately following. So, okay. um, so St. Thomas and St. Bonaventure lived at the same time. They knew each other. They were friends. Scotus was immediately following. And, um, so he right. had the benefit of being able to react to these things. Now it's interesting, uh, Actually, it just brought this to mind. Both St. Bonaventure and St. Thomas do not hold to the, prim the absolute primacy of Christ. But their teacher, uh, St. Albert the Great, uh, the, the Dominican master who was, he was called the universal doctor before St. Thomas was, right? Uh, he did hold to the primacy of Christ. And so it's interesting that they both, they both rejected that teaching of their master. And then, of course, Scotus ends up coming around and saying, no, I, I do accept it. But he explained it a lot better. And I, I personally think that if he had been around, uh, that at the time to explain it uh, with these strong arguments that St. Thomas would have accepted it. But that's interesting. And so, so, but this was held before SCOTUS. So this, it was oh, held yeah. obviously then by, by, by the church fathers. And yes, yes. Uh, the whole okay. Eastern patristic, uh, Eastern patristic tradition holds to this. Uh, uh, so we'll get into which saints held it a little later, but 
Scotus just he just brought a really great intellect to the table and laid it out in a very strong argument. So, got it. Okay, so we'll we'll go through some of scripture next, um, and that would be slide seven. We'll start with First Colossians, uh, one, thirteen through twenty. So I'll read it first, real quick, and just keep in mind what we've what we said so far. Keep in mind that this is talking about Christ, and then we'll explain it. Giving thanks to God the Father, who hath made us worthy to be partakers of the lot of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the remission of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For in him were all things created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominations or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and in him. And he is before all, and by him all things consist." And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may hold the primacy, because in him it hath well pleased the Father that all fullness should dwell, and through him to reconcile all things unto himself, making peace through the blood of his cross, both as to the things that are on earth and the things that are in heaven. So you probably heard the word primacy in there. I emphasize that that's because this doctrine gets its name from this passage. It's very important to to the Scotists. So the first thing to note here is that verses 16 and 17 uh, clearly teach an absolute primacy of Christ. Uh, The only way to get around this text is to claim that it's speaking here of Christ as God, but not as man. And I'll explain why that can't be the case. Uh, And when I say it's, when I say it clearly teaches an absolute primacy, that's because it says all things were created by him and in him. He's before all and by him all things consist. Uh, So those things are not explaining a relative primacy. Now, the subject of the entire text is Jesus Christ, the incarnate word, and it does not change subjects by referring at times to Christ as such and other times uh, to the eternal word as such. And so here's the proof. First, uh, there's no interruption to indicate a change of subject. The text starts by speaking of him as our redeemer and ends by speaking of the blood of his cross. Uh, neither of those things can be said of the eternal word before taking flesh. Uh, It's therefore natural to assume that the middle portion of the text also refers to the incarnate word. And to insist otherwise is to do violence to the text in order to fit into a preconceived doctrine. And the second proof is it has to do with the history. So we know that in that St. Paul, in these epistles, he's correcting these churches for different errors oftentimes. And so uh, the Colossians were being corrected in this epistle concerning a specific error. They believe the angels to be beings in between God and creation, kind of like a, a Platonic demiurge. So they, they saw them as mediators with God apart from Christ, like an alternative mediator. Um, and so they were putting them on a, a par with Christ in, in a sense. And so that's when St. Paul insists in verse 16 that all spirits, all the principalities, powers, uh, etc., were created in him. He means in Christ Jesus. Uh, he doesn't have any reason to insist that the angels were created in God, the Word, because the Colossians were not attempting to place the angels on an equal footing with God, the Word. They were trying to put him on an equal footing, uh, the angels on an equal footing with Jesus Christ, the God man. Um, and another proof is uh, verse 15, which states, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Now, that word firstborn, in common sense, and also in all of sacred scripture, firstborn always indicates a subject with the same nature as its brethren. So when the Hebrews offered up the firstborn of their flocks of sheep uh, in sacrifice, the firstborn had to be a sheep. Uh, They couldn't offer up a cow uh, as the firstborn of the sheep because a cow does not share the sheep's nature. Therefore, when St. Paul calls Christ the firstborn of every creature, he's speaking of Christ insofar as he shares a nature with creatures as man. The eternal word as such cannot be said to be the firstborn of every creature, being himself uncreated God. Uh, The Church Fathers, uh, especially St. Hilary and St. Athanasius, they point this out in their writings uh, against the Arian heretics, because the Arians attempted to apply those words, firstborn of every creature, to the eternal word, and thus prove that the word is a creature. Uh, So that's, that's an interesting testimony from the Church Fathers. Uh, Another proof is, it comes from typology, so just that is to say that the types of, of Christ. So under the old, or the, the foreshadowings of Christ. So under the old law, um, both the first fruits of crops and the firstborn of livestock, they had to be offered to God in sacrifice. And that sacrifice brought blessings upon or sanctified the rest of the crops or livestock of the same kind. 
So Christ as man is likewise offered in sacrifice to God, affecting the blessing and sanctification of his brethren. Uh, since mankind is a microcosm of all creation, that is, he has within himself the perfections of both physical and spiritual creation, uh, Christ, in a certain sense, affects the sanctification and blessing of all of creation in his sacrifice of his of his human uh, nature, right, in his death. Thus, he shows himself to be the firstborn of all creation, precisely in his human nature. And again, uh, the firstborn male under the old law, that is a human firstborn male, he received a double portion of inheritance. So uh, if I was the firstborn of four brothers, I would not receive uh, a quarter of the inheritance, but I'd receive two-fifths. It'd be divided into fifths, and I'd get two-fifths, uh, so a double portion. But, but what is our inheritance as, as Christians, as children of God? Our inheritance is God himself, insofar as we're given to share in his nature. Uh, St. Paul says this in Ephesians 1. He says, he talks about the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the pledge of our inheritance. And that means that sanctifying grace, which is appropriated to the Holy Ghost, uh, is the pledge or the earnest money of our inheritance, the fullness of which is heavenly glory. So both grace and glory are a created participation in the divine nature. Um, but the sacred humanity of Jesus Christ participates in the divine nature, not only by the fullness of grace, but also by being taken up into the, the second person of the Blessed Trinity by the hypostatic union. So in that way, Jesus Christ fulfills another quality of the firstborn, he receives a double inheritance because our inheritance is participation in the divine nature, and he perceives in it. He, he participates in it in two different ways: by the hypostatic union and by grace. And that's. It might sound like a, a something you're not familiar with, but that's a very important theological truth. So, um, because he's divinized twice over, it sh he shows that he's a firstborn in that sense too, and that can only be said of Christ as man, not as the uh, not as the eternal Word. Thus, firstborn of all creation refers to Christ as man. Now, it also states in that text uh, that he is the image of the invisible God. Uh, invisibility is an attribute of the divine nature, uh, and as such, it applies equally to all three persons. So we couldn't say the Father is invisible as opposed to the Son or the Holy Ghost. It, it doesn't identify one person. It is applicable to all of them. So, um, so it refers to the divine nature as such. So the question then is, is the eternal word the image of the divine nature? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, he's identical with the divine nature. All three persons are. And so he can't be called its image. Uh, in Trinitarian theology, the word is rather the image of the Father. Uh, but we already established that the Father cannot be distinguished from the other divine persons by the word invisible God. So therefore, the eternal word can't be called the image of the invisible God. Uh, Jesus Christ, the God-man, is in fact the image of the invisible God, for he is the exemplar of humanity, which was made in the image and likeness of God. And he also literally makes visible the invisible Godhead by taking flesh. Uh, in the preface of the Mass for Christmas, which we all uh, heard so recently, the priest says, quote, Through the mystery of the Word made flesh, the new light of thy glory hath shone upon the eyes of our mind, so that while we acknowledge God in visible form, we may through him be drawn to, love, to the love of things invisible. Thus, it's clear that this text refers to Jesus Christ incarnate as the, quote, image of the invisible God. So that brings up a question. Jesus Christ came 4,000 years after creation began. So how can he be said to be the firstborn of every creature in whom all things were created? Uh, it seems to be a contradiction. Um, so to answer the question, you have to step back a second, because we're going to have to go outside of time. So I have to explain a basic philosophical principle first, and that the principle is this. That which is first in the order of intention is last in the order of execution. We kind of touched on this earlier, but it's, it's best explained by an example. So I think most people are familiar with the game of pool or billiards. So if, it, if it's my turn in a game of pool, my goal is, to, let's say, to get the seven ball into that corner pocket, or, or my goal is to get a point. How do I get a point? By getting that seven ball into that corner pocket. How do I get that seven ball into the corner pocket? By hitting it with my cue ball at this particular angle. Well, how do I do that? I got to bounce it off the, the wall. How do I do that? I have to hit it with my stick at the perfect angle. Okay, so that's my plan. First, I will the end, and then I will all the means. And then in the order that's the order of intention. The order of execution, I do it all in reverse. First, I move the stick. Then I hit the cue ball. Then the cue ball bounces off the wall. Then it hits the seven. Then the seven goes into the pocket, and thus I score the point. 
So the first thing that I intended is the last thing that I execute when I actually carry out my plan. And so keeping that principle in mind, we would say Jesus Christ is called the firstborn uh, because he was the first thing willed by God outside of himself. So he was the first thing God intended, but he's the last thing in the order of execution. Uh, so the human nature of Christ was the first thing God decided to create. But this mystery was, quote, hidden from eternity in God and only revealed in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Christ is the first in the order of intention, which comes last in the order of execution. Thus, the incarnation is rightly called the firstborn of all creation, for God willed him first and willed every other created thing only for his sake. Now, verse 16 says that all things were created by him and in him, and he is before all, and by him all things consist. So, when we say that, uh, when St. Paul says, rather, that all things were created by Christ, it's talking about a type of causality. It would be called, would be called an efficient, meritorious causality. So uh, the efficient cause of all creation is God himself. God created all, all things. Jesus Christ didn't exist at the time of creation. So he didn't create in the sense that he was, uh, that God made him and then he created everything. No. But when you say he was the efficient, uh, meritorious cause, it means that God Having decreed first the incarnation, he foresaw the meritorious love of Jesus Christ, and he created all else on account of his foreseen merits. So he saw, he willed Jesus Christ, he saw what glorious love he would give to God, to, to the Holy Trinity, and for his sake he willed everything else as a sort of reward, so to say. So he merited that everything else should exist, and, and he merited this in God's foresight. So that's what we mean uh, when we say, when St. Paul says that. And St. Paul also says that, he, that all things were created in Christ. And that means that Jesus Christ is the exemplary cause of all else in creation. And that means that uh, he's the exemplar. He possesses all of the perfections of created nature in an eminent way. And in this sense, he can rightly be said, uh, all, all else can be rightly said to have been created in him. So he's like the, the, the model of all else, right? He contains all those perfections. Everything else is like a reflection of him. Um, and St. Paul also says, he's before all, and by him all things consist. So this shows Christ to be the final cause, or the goal of all creation. The final cause is before all in the order of intention, and all else is indeed ordered towards this final cause or goal. And it's interesting to note here that these aren't just my interpretations, they're not just the interpretations of the Franciscan school, but they're substantially the same interpretations given by uh, Father Cornelius Alapide who I think many of our listeners will know, certainly the priests would know, because he's widely considered to be the very best uh, medieval commentator on sacred scripture. Um, he's a Jesuit father, so obviously it wasn't exclusive to the Franciscan school. Any questions? No, I, I okay. think it's good. I mean, I'm not, I'm not admitting that I, I understand it all, but I, I don't have any sure, questions. Sure. <laughs> sure. I just don't want to keep blathering if, if, if I have no, no, no. something. Or... Go for it. All right, well then, uh, the next scriptural uh, passage we'll look at is Ephesians, and that's slide eight. Uh, it's Ephesians 1, number, uh, or rather verses 3 through 10. So, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and unspotted in his sight in charity, who hath predestinated us unto the adoption of children through Jesus Christ unto himself according to the purpose of his will, under the praise of the glory of his grace, in which he hath graced us in his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the remission of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which hath superabounded in us in all wisdom and prudence, that he might make known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in him, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, to reestablish all things in Christ that are in heaven and on earth in him." Now, in um, verses 3 through 6, St. Paul clearly teaches here that Jesus Christ was chosen before the foundation of the world, and that we were chosen in him. His predestination, then, is primary, and all of our spiritual blessings are given to us by God, quote, in Christ Jesus. God, quote, chose us in him. He, quote, predestinated us under the adoption of children through Jesus Christ. And grace, too, is given to us, quote, in his beloved Son. And note that sin is not so much as mentioned in these verses. Uh, God wills Jesus Christ, the God-man, absolutely, before anything else, and then he elects man in view of his Christ. Verse 10, it states, 
quote, to reestablish all things in Christ. It's a famous phrase. It was the, the, the um, what's the word? St. Pius X used it as his uh, motto. I don't know. What the, there's a motto is not the right, right word, but anyway, it was his, his slogan of his papacy. At any, uh, at any rate, it's, it's worth noting here that the Greek word uh, for, that we, we have here as reestablish, the Greek word indicates a lot more than to reestablish. Uh, it actually indicates to gather together all things under the headship of Christ. Uh, St. Jerome, actually, when he wrote the Vulgate, he said that he was shocked to find the Greek translated by other Latin translators as instaurare, or reestablish. But he kept it that way out of respect for the established Latin tradition. Uh, they used that word there, so he, he did too. But he noted the fuller meaning of the word. So verses 9 and 10, then, can be more accurately translated as that he might make known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in him in the dispensation of the fullness of times to gather together all things under the headship of Christ that are in heaven and on earth in him. Now, that reading indicates more clearly that Christ was always willed as the head of creation and not merely as a sort of afterthought. So um, if you'll pull up slide nine, we're going to go to the Old Testament. Now, obviously, the Old Testament, uh, the people at the time wouldn't have known that this was about the incarnation, but in hindsight, because we have the fullness of Revelation with the New Testament, we, we can go back and we should go back and be able to see uh, what was really being said in some of the more mysterious passages. So this whole passage is speaking of uh, wisdom. It's, it's wisdom speaking, rather. And um, we can see now that it's incarnate wisdom that's speaking. So keep that in mind when I read it. Um, it's fairly long, uh, but stay with me. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways, before he made anything from the beginning. I was set up from eternity and of old before the earth was made. The depths were not as yet, and I was already conceived. Neither had the fountains of waters as yet sprung out. The mountains with their huge bulk had not as yet been established. Before the hills I was brought forth. He had not yet made the earth, nor the rivers, nor the poles of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was present. When, with a certain law and compass, he enclosed the depths. When he established the sky above and poised the fountains of waters. When he compassed the sea with its bounds and set a law to the waters that they should not pass their limits, when he balanced the foundations of the earth, I was with him forming all things and was delighted every day, playing before him at all times, playing in the world, and my delights were, be, were to be with the children of men. Now therefore, ye children, hear me. Blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me <clears throat> and that watcheth daily at my gates and waiteth at the posts of my doors. He, shall, he that shall find me shall find life, and shall have salvation from the Lord. But he that shall sin against me shall hurt his own soul. All that hate me love death. Now this next part here is from the next chapter, and think especially of his church, the seven sacraments, etc. Wisdom hath built herself a house. She hath hewn her out seven pillars. She hath slain her victims, mingled her wine, and set forth her table. She hath sent her maids to invite her to the tower, to the, invite to the tower and to the walls of the city. Whosoever is a little one, let him come to me. And to the unwise, she said, Come, eat my bread and drink the wine which I have mingled for you. Forsake childlessness and live and walk by the ways of prudence. So that's the passage. Now note um, here that portions of this text, uh, I'm sure you're probably all familiar with this, is they're used by the church for masses of the feasts of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, and this is interesting because it's explained why this is done in the papal bull in Fabulis Deus, which is the bull that defined the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. So the reason is given um, that these texts refer to the predestination of the incarnate word and that Mary and Christ were predestined in one and the same decree. Uh, Pope Pius XII also, as Cardinal Pacelli, stated the same thing. And he said that this interpretation is, quote, the mind of the church. So thus, we must acknowledge that a primary interpretation of those texts is to attribute what is said of wisdom to Jesus Christ incarnate. In the light of this, we can see that Jesus Christ incarnate was willed by God before the foundation of the earth, etc. The text goes on at length to show that throughout all the days of creation, with their specific works, this incarnate wisdom was before the mind of God, quote, delighted every day, playing before him at all times. Uh, we could picture the Eternal Father foreseeing the child Jesus playing in the world, which was created for his sake. And some try to explain that text by saying that God simply foreknew Christ, and hence the Blessed Virgin Mary, before he actually created the world. 
Uh, I've heard that many times. But this this can be said of any and all creatures. Uh, God foreknew you, he foreknew me, he foreknew this computer before he actually created. It's not really saying anything. And we'd have to say this this verse, this uh, passage really waxes on for a long time to teach us something that's rather obvious. Um, so the text would be teaching us really nothing if it's just asserting that God's foreknowledge of Christ preceded time. And since we know from the ordinary magisterium, uh, that is from that papal bull, that these texts refer to Christ and Mary's predestination, we must rather see them as teaching that Jesus Christ and Mary were willed by God prior to him willing the mountains, the deep, etc. In a word, the incarnate wisdom and his mother were decreed by God first, and all else was willed for their sake. The last six verses quoted are especially noteworthy since they speak of wisdom building a house with seven pillars, sacrifice, wine and bread, all of which, uh, the, or, or rather, wine and bread of which the little ones shall eat. I mean, I think that's pretty clearly a prefiguration of Christ's church with seven sacraments, the sacrifice of Christ under the species of bread and wine in the Mass. Clearly, then, the wisdom of which the text is speaking is the incarnate wisdom, the God-man Jesus Christ. Um, another text that I'm not going to go into because we don't have the time for it, but I am going to suggest to our listeners um, to read um, and to think about these principles and to uh, to maybe see some new lights in sacred scripture, is Ecclesiasticus, or perhaps your Bible will say Sirach, but Ecclesiasticus uh, chapter 24, verses 1 through 31. Um, keep in mind that the God-man is the firstborn of all creation, and, and go over those texts. So the next thing I'd like to go over or to discuss is the, the, the consequences of this doctrine, of either side, because it it's one thing to have an abstract theory. It's another thing to say, well, what, like you ask, you ask this a lot, Kevin. You say, well, what's the rub here? What can we do with this? You know, right. so there are serious consequences. So if, um, if you'll pull up slide 10, we'll read the, we'll go through the consequences of the Thomistic thesis. Mm -hmm. and, um, the, the first one is, has to do with the economy of salvation. There ends up being two separate economies of salvation. Now that's another 25 cent word, but it means simply an uh, economy of salvation that simply refers to God's plan of creation concerning salvation. Um, so the Thomistic system is two. So the Franciscan thesis posits one single economy of salvation, which is the one under which we currently live. As sacred scripture says, Jesus Christ is the one mediator between God and man. No one comes to the Father but through him, and neither is there salvation in any other. Grace and glory are possible for rational creatures only in and through Jesus Christ. This applies equally to you and I right now, to Adam and Eve before and after the fall, as well as to the angels. That's in the Franciscan system. But the Thomists assert that this present economy of salvation pertains only to man after the fall. Before the fall, there was a different economy of salvation, wherein men and angels received grace directly from God without reference to the incarnation whatsoever. They assert that the angels in heaven do not receive their essential glory from Christ and thus are not united to him as head in the same manner that we are. They do, they do say that Christ is their head, but not in the same way. But if we, together with the angels, form one mystical body of Christ, as Pope Pius XII teaches in Mystici Corporis, then how can some members of the body receive essential glory from their head while others don't? Doesn't this create some sort of a deformed body, wherein some members are attached to the head essentially, and others only accidentally? So that's one consequence. Uh, number two, and this is a serious one, uh, Jesus Christ is not the universal mediator of all grace, and neither is the Blessed Virgin Mary the mediatrix of all grace. Sounds pretty serious, but let me explain it. So the, um, the Church Fathers teach that our reception of the divine nature by grace flows from God's reception of our human nature in the Incarnation. So you've probably heard the quote, God became man so that man might become God. In other words, God clothed himself with, with humanity so that we might clothe ourselves with divinity by grace. So it's a famous axiom, and many church fathers repeat it. Thus, Jesus Christ is the one and only mediator of grace, being himself God and man. But in the Thomistic system, all of the untold billions of angels, as well as Adam and Eve before the fall, received grace apart from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is no longer the one mediator within this system, at least in the proper univocal sense of the term. And how can they possibly affirm what he says in the Gospel of St. John, quote, No man cometh to the Father but by me, if both Adam and Eve received sanctifying grace, and therefore were adoptive sons of the Father, without going through Christ. 
As an immediate corollary, the Blessed Virgin Mary is no longer the mediatrix of all grace, but rather the mediatrix of most grace, or the mediatrix of some grace. Now, while the Thomas do admit the terms universal mediator and mediatrix of all grace, it seems quite clear that the terms cannot be understood simply and literally, but rather in an equivocal, qualified sense. Um, number three, if this thesis is admitted, then Jesus Christ, the just judge himself, would owe Adam a debt of gratitude for his sin, for violating God's commandment, because Christ's very existence and predestination would be dependent upon Adam's sin. So you'd have to say, thank you, Adam, for sinning, because now I, now I exist, now I have, uh, now I have glory, uh, that is, the, the glory uh, in his human nature, uh, having been predestined, on, on account of Adam. Uh, Suarez actually brought that up, and he brought it up kind of as a, as a joke, but <laughs> he was saying, look how absurd this is. But uh, Number four, uh, it would mean that Adam is more noble in his order as natural head of the human race than Jesus Christ is in his order as supernatural head. And that requires a little explaining. So Adam is the source of natural life for each and every human, including Christ and Mary. Now, in the Franciscan thesis, there's an exact parallel found in Christ. Christ is the source of supernatural life for each and every human, including Adam and Eve. And likewise with Adam, that, that nature is given to us through Eve. So likewise with Christ, that, that, that divine nature is given us, to us through the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's a beautiful parallel. Uh, but this, it is, it's really worthy of meditation. I encourage you to. But uh, the Thomistic thesis, however, excludes Adam and Eve from receiving first grace through Christ. But if Christ is not admitted to be the source of supernatural life for each and every human being, including Adam and Eve, it's equivalent to saying that Adam is more noble in his order than Christ is in his. It is to declare that in this case, the model, Jesus Christ, is inferior to Adam, his copy. In this case, not, not in general, but in this instance. So, Does that all make sense? Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. So... Um, Let's go through some consequences of the Franciscan thesis, and that would be slide 11. So, the first one, we, we touched on this when we were uh, speaking of one of the passages of sacred scripture, which I can't remember. Um, but Christ has, a, he, he is the final exemplary and efficient meritorious cause of all creation. So, it's called the threefold secondary causality of Christ. Secondary because the first cause is God himself as God. Uh, so the final cause, his final cause, Christ is the goal of all creation. As exemplary cause, he is the model containing all the perfections of creatures in an eminent way. As efficient meritorious cause, we say that God, having first willed the God-man Jesus Christ, he foresaw his merits and his infinite love, and he created all other things as a reward for Christ's merits. Now, this doctrine is why St. Francis himself had such an intimate love for creatures, uh, using them as a ladder to climb to God. It's because he saw that they all pointed to Christ. They all reflected Christ, and they were all made to glorify Christ. Um, he, was, he was in a sort of ecstasy looking around him because this, these things were always before his eyes. Um, number two is the Immaculate Conception. So uh, this used to be a disputed question between the Franciscans and the Dominicans for a very long time, right up until the dogma was defined. Uh, but it, it actually, for the Franciscans, it flows from this doctrine, from the, the doctrine of the absolute primacy. So the Franciscan school holds that Mary was predestined with Christ in one and the same decree prior to the decree of original sin. So therefore, Mary is in no way subject to the law of sin because she was she was decreed by God prior to that. And she's not subject to subsequent decrees. So she's no way subject to the law of sin, belonging to what theologians call the hypostatic order. Her and Christ are in their, are in their own order of creation uh, uh, above and apart from the, the, other, the other things that are subject to sin. Now, this teaching was quoted directly in the dogmatic definitions of both the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption, which state that Christ and Mary were predestined in, quote, one and the same decree. That 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 phrasing comes exclusively from the Scotus uh, teaching uh, on the primacy of Christ. Um, but the papal bulls certainly don't intend to settle the question. But it is interesting that they quoted it from that. It, and certainly theologians at the time noted that. Some of them uh, with with excitement. Some of them probably grinding their teeth. But, <laughs> um, uh, but it doesn't settle the question uh, because all it's saying is they were predestined in the same decree. But it doesn't say that the predestination was prior to Adam's sin, uh, to the, to the prevision of Adam's sin. 
Uh, but it, it also means this, this also means that Franciscans do not believe that Mary has a quote debt of sin. And that the Thomists do hold uh, that Mary has a debt of sin. And a lot of theologians hold that. Um, we won't get into exactly what that means, but uh, Suffice to say, the Franciscans don't hold that because of the absolute primacy, so that's a consequence. Number three, um, the typology of Christ before the fall is rendered intelligible. So typology, again, we're talking about foreshadowings of Christ. So like a good, a good example is Melchizedek, right? Melchizedek in the Old Testament was a priest and a king. He offered sacrifice to God in the form of bread and wine. And that obviously was fulfilled by Christ. It was a foreshadowing of Christ. Christ fulfilled it. So... There's foreshadowings of Christ like this, type, types of Christ uh, that were before the fall. And so um, let's see here. So the first one is that Adam was placed into a deep sleep and Eve was drawn from his side. Adam then prophesied saying, quote, this now is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Wherefore, a man shall leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall be two in one flesh. Now, St. Paul teaches clearly that this was a prophecy and type of Christ in his church. Like Adam, when Christ went into the deep sleep of death, blood and water came forth from his side, as, even as Eve came forth from Adam's side. And the blood and water are figures of the sacraments of baptism and the Holy Eucharist. Right? Uh, that's what the church fathers say. Thus the church, Christ's bride, came from his side just like Eve came from Adam. And now remember that this type was prior to the fall. Another type uh, is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's actually a type of Christ. Um, oh, excuse me. The alarm going off. Let me just shut that off for, because it's going to go off again. Happens to the best of us. I apologize for that. <laughs> if I can get it shut off. Okay, so... One moment. Hopefully you can cut this out, this little break here. Um, so the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a type of Christ. So Eve was told by her husband, who was commanded by God, not to eat from the tree or that she would die the death. Now the church was told by her husband, Christ, that we must eat the Holy Eucharist or we will die the death. We will have no life in us. Uh, Eve's senses told her that the fruit was good to eat. But God's word, given to her through her husband, told her that the fruit was bad for her. Our senses tell us that the Holy Eucharist is merely bread and wine, but God's word, given to the church through her husband, Christ, tells us that the Holy Eucharist is good to eat and that it's Christ himself. They followed their senses instead of God. They ate and died the death. We follow God instead of our senses. We eat and we have eternal life. But the tree itself and the test were before the fall, yet they were types of Christ. Now, the tree of life is also a type of Christ because it grants eternal life to those who eat it. Uh, and another interesting one is that many and perhaps most theologians hold that the test of the angels consisted in being shown the mystery of the incarnation and seeing that they would be made to serve one whose nature was so far below their own, that is, the human nature is below the angelic. Um, it motivated some angels to praise God and others to rebel. And this, of course, was before Adam's sin. But here's the rub. If it is true that, quote, if man had not sinned, the Son of Man would not have come, how do we explain all of these types as well as Adam's prophecy existing prior to Adam's sin? In the hypothetical scenario wherein Adam does not sin, the angel's test would have consisted in submitting to the dominion of a God-man who would never actually exist. Uh, Eve coming from Adam's rib during his sleep would have had no greater theological meaning and would have foreshadowed nothing at all, while her husband's prophecy would never have been realized. Likewise, the tree of good and evil, as well as the tree of life, would seem totally arbitrary and incoherent if they weren't pointing to a future Christ. Uh, the same can be said of many other types, such as Eve and the earth itself, both of which are types of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So next, um, I have a, some objections, it's common objections that we can go through. Um, and that would be slide 12, actually. Okay, so this is a really common objection. This is the O Felix Culpa, the O Happy Fault. This comes from the Exultet, which is sung at the blessing of the Easter candle on Easter, uh, Easter Mass. So it says, it says this, O truly necessary sin of Adam, 
which the death of Christ has blotted out, O oh, happy fault that merited such and so great a redeemer. Now, it sounds like that's a nail in the coffin of our, of our position here, but uh, it's not, and I'll explain why. First of all, we have to note that this whole thing must be interpreted poetically, because if Adam's sin was, quote, truly necessary in the literal sense, then we couldn't say that God merely permitted his sin. We would have to say that he positively willed his sin. Uh, but this would attribute a moral evil to God, and that would be blasphemy, and no one, no one alleges that. So we have to interpret it poetically. Also, oh, happy fault must be interpreted poetically, because taking pleasure in the sin of another is sinful, right? That's that's uh, en that's envy, right? To to take joy in someone else's uh, fall, someone else's misfortune. So it also says, "Oh, happy fault that merited such and so great a redeemer." But we know that sin does not literally merit anything but condemnation. So it's again, it's poetic. So so what is it really teaching here? The the true doctrine contained here is that sin was only permitted in order to bring about a greater good, that we would have. That that greater good is that we would have Jesus Christ as our Redeemer. Oh, happy fault that merited such and so great a Redeemer. Uh, but it does not say that Adam's sin was the occasion of the God-man himself, but merely that Adam's sin was the occasion of the God-man becoming for us such and so great a Redeemer. So Jesus Christ then would have existed with or without Adam's sin. However, since Adam sinned, Christ is now a great Redeemer for us. And we rightly rejoice that God drew forth such a great good from the fault of Adam. <clears throat> okay, so slide 13 is another common objection. and it, it, This one comes from the Creed, now the Nicene Creed, which we pray at Mass. It says, for... Oh, that is just... Okay, it says it's not going to go off again. I apologize. <laughs> Okay, so um, the Creed says, the Nicene Creed uh, says, For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Ghost was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. Now, the, our opponents would say, well, see, the incarnation was for us men and for our salvation. But there's some problems there. So first, uh, the Creed lists two causes for the incarnation, right? For us men and for our salvation. Those are two separate uh, clauses of the Creed. Uh, but the creed does not intend to list all of the causes of the incarnation, and it doesn't intend to teach which causes have priority over others. Um, we have to note that the, these part, different portions of the creed were brought about during different times in order to address specific errors. So we can't read into it more than what it was meant to address. But also, it says, um, for our salvation. What does that mean? Th these words are not identical to for our redemption from sin. Salvation is not the same thing as redemption. And this is noted already by St. Irenaeus uh, in the 100s. He, he taught that the, that the word salvation essentially refers to our elevation from mere nature to a participation in God's divine life by grace. So it's not essentially talking about redemption from sin, but elevation to grace. Thus, the creed is not explicitly referring to our redemption from sin here, but our deification by grace. Uh, and furthermore, all schools admit that Christ came for us men and for our salvation. All Catholics must admit that. It's in the Creed. Uh, they, but we all likewise admit that Christ came to glorify God infinitely. So the dispute is over which cause is logically prior. Uh, so the Creed doesn't actually shed any light on the disputed question. Um, another common objection or uh, argument from the other side is the Church Fathers. And I don't have a slide for this, but many fathers are cited um, to support the Thomistic view, especially St. Augustine and certain portions of St. Cyril of Alexandria. But many fathers likewise teach the Franciscan view, uh, notably the entire Eastern tradition, uh, which notably St. Thomas did not read Greek. Of all, for all of his genius, that's one, that's one thing he, he wasn't able to do with all, all of his other things that he did at the time. Right? So can't do everything. So some, some writers like St. Maximus, who we read earlier, earlier, weren't accessible to Western theologians at the time. Um, but also including uh, notably St. Cyril of Alexandria, who's often quoted against this thesis. When he's read in full, he very much supports it, like all the other Easterners. Uh, but since unanimity of the fathers is lacking, it seems that the testimony of the fathers is good for demonstrating the antiquity of both views, but it can't settle the matter uh, definitively. But it is worth noting that uh, St. Francis de Sales, a doctor of the church known for his knowledge of the church fathers, he states explicitly that he came to his position by an attentive study of scripture and the fathers. 
and he maintains that both uphold the absolute primacy of Christ. And this can be read in Book 2, Chapter 4 of his treatise on the love of God. It's wonderful. Everything he writes is wonderful. But um, So finally, I have some supporting testimonies. These aren't proofs, but they're things that certainly strengthen uh, the argument here. So if you'll pull up slide 14, I have a list of, um, it's a partial list of saints and theologians who explicitly teach the absolute primacy. So we have St. Maximus the Confessor, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, these are both fathers of the church, St. Irenaeus, St. Cyril of Alexandria, St. John Damascene, Robert Grossetest, St. Athanasius, Doctor of the Church, St. Gregory Nazianzen, Doctor of the Church, St. John Chrysostom, Doctor of the Church, St. Andrew of Crete, Blessed Raymond Lowell, St. Mary Mandolin de Pazzi, St. Albert the Great, Doctor of the Church, St. Francis of Assisi, Alexander of Hales, Blessed John Duns Scotus, St. Bernardin of Siena, St. Lawrence of Bendizi, not only a doctor of the church, but he was the most recent doctor that we've received. Pope Pius XII made him a doctor of the church. So interesting. He's especially uh, perhaps relevant for our times because that's how providence works. Uh, St. Francis de Sales, doctor of the church. Father Frederick Faber, who is well beloved by many traditional Catholics. Pope Pius XII. And Francisco Suarez, which is interesting because he is an eminent Thomist, perhaps one of the most eminent Thomists, despite uh, Dominican Thomas disagreeing with him because he was a Jesuit Thomas, but uh, it's interesting because he upheld the Thomas position uh, out of obedience in all of his writings. He was bound, I, I think they may be bound by the rule, but he was certainly bound by his superiors to defend the Thomas position, and so he did. He wrote these uh, new explanations of why one should hold the St. Thomas, but he revealed toward the end of his life that he could never actually internally assent to them, and he personally held that Jesus Christ would have come regardless of Adam's sin. So it shows that he has great obedience, and he also had great integrity to say, you know, I couldn't actually assent to this. <laughs> Pretty interesting. Uh, another supporting document is The Mystical City of God. Uh, that's book one, chapters three and four. Now, some people don't like this book. Some people cite the Catholic Encyclopedia and they try to discredit it because the Catholic Encyclopedia says that it was condemned. Uh, I would defer to the six official papal approbations of the book that approve it uh, and the in-depth study of Dom Guéranger, who reviewed all the papal documents and the theological proceedings before ardently defending the book in a series of 24 articles. So you could take that what you will, but it's um, if you get a chance to read it, book one, chapters three and four, really wonderful. It was revealed to her by the, by the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, the order of creation. And it, it, it's a, it goes into more detail than, than what I've talked about here, because it's talking about what God actually willed and how he willed it, but it's beautiful. Uh, another supporting proof is a prayer called the Prayer to Christ the King. Uh, we prayed this actually at our chapel before Mass uh, every Sunday, and I've, I've seen other chapels, CMRI chapels do that too. So Father Chrysostom Urutabedi, OFM. I think I'm pronouncing that right. It's French, so maybe not. Uh, he's easily was the foremost theologian at the turn of the 19th century concerning this topic. And he wrote extensively about the absolute primacy of Christ. Uh, he was also well known for promoting devotion to Jesus Christ under the title of Christ the King, well before the feast was established in 1925. And he composed a short prayer to Christ the King, which explicitly mentions his absolute primacy spreading it first amongst his local brothers and then the entire Franciscan order. And he ended up petitioning Pope St. Pius X to grant an indulgence for this prayer, and it was granted. Uh, the partial indulgence was increased twice, and finally the prayer received a plenary indulgence from Pope Pius XI several years before the same pope instituted the Feast of Christ the King. And to my knowledge, no other prayer of similar length has been granted a daily plenary indulgence with no additional requirements besides the usual ones, which apply to all indulgences. For instance, even the, the famous prayer before the crucifix, you have to be before a crucifix to gain that. So this one, there's no other requirements. Um, and also the prayer before a crucifix was instituted several years later. So this was really a, a first. But... Um, the prayer begins, O Christ Jesus, I acknowledge thee to be the king of the universe. All that has been made is created for thee. And thus, the incarnate word is identified as the final cause of all creation, the goal. Everything was made for him. But if Adam is made for the sake of the incarnation, for the sake of Jesus Christ, then the incarnation can in no way be said to depend on Adam for his existence, and much less on Adam's sin. 
So thus, we have the Sovereign Pontiff officially approving a prayer for the Universal Church, which explicitly and intentionally teaches the absolute primacy of Christ, and the same Pope encourages the recitation of the prayer in the strongest way possible by attaching the highest possible indulgence to it. Uh, it's indeed the easiest plenary indulgence to acquire. So I would say that it's, it can, it's rash at, at this point to deny that great doctrine in light of that fact. It's just debatable, but... Um, do you have any questions about about what I went through? It's, it's, that's that's basically it. I just have a short conclusion, but that's 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 it. I, I, it it's terrible. I mean, I, I really wish I did. <laughs> I mean, I, mean I, I hate to have you go through everything and not really have questions. I mean, it's I, it really is something I think it kind of has to soak in. I mean, I think sure. I think and I think you explained it really well. I, I think it's laid out well enough that honestly, it's more of something that I need to really contemplate rather than talk yeah. about it. I, I don't really know what to ask. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, and it's a beautiful thing. And I think it's, it's one of the more unique shows I think I've ever had on this podcast. I mean, it's very thought provoking. And I, and I, and I think it's an interesting thing too. And I, I like how you describe again, the importance of understanding what, what a thesis is. And I think we mm -hmm. all know in our times, how important that is to know, you know, what, what is a, not what is something that is important and it's good to understand and know and contemplate and meditate on, but is not something that you have to believe to be Catholic. And this is something we all need to, uh, that, that, that's the one comment I'd like to give that I think this is, these are really good, important things, but, but, but we don't have to, you know, it does not make us more or less Catholic to be on the sure. Thomas side or the Franciscan side, but, but otherwise I, I, I greatly appreciate it. I think it was a uh, very fascinating. And, you know, it is uh, one of those topics that historically w there were some harsh words said from side from both sides to, to sure. the other. Right. And with the Immaculate Conception, even more so. I mean, that, that was one where the Pope had to say, don't call each other heretics anymore. Now we can call those who deny the Immaculate Conception, the maculists. We can call them heretics now. But, right. but for a long time, it was, it was forbidden. So um, I would just I would, wanted to say, too, that um, this particular doctrine has been re really fruitful for my spiritual life. So I encourage people to, to really think about it, meditate on it. And also. Um, I would encourage them to look into the show notes. I put there's a bibliography of uh, a number of different books that I've I've referenced, um, and also they might be really good for people. Some of them are good for the spiritual life. Some of them are good for study. Um, some of them might be over over the head of some people or whatever. But uh, at least if you want to do more research, if it's interesting to you, look into it. And also feel free to post questions in the comments. I'd be happy to answer them. Um, and if this interests anyone. Uh, even more, I'd be happy to, to talk more in detail about it. There's certainly a lot that I didn't touch on with the actual history of how this came about, all these things, but that's just my own nerdy self getting in, getting into this topic. But, so in well, conclusion then, oh, sorry. Real quickly, I, I do have one question for you. What, what, and okay, obviously I guess the, you're the third order Franciscan, so I, mean, I guess that's part of the answer, but what makes you interested in this? What what gives you this? You know, I, I think a lot of people, you, you say the nerdy side of you. I think that's it's fascinating because I think a lot of people would be like, okay, I'm going to go and do this great study on, I don't know, Star Wars, you know, whatever. You, you get my point. I mean, so it's gonna, I, I want to really look into this and write up my own opinions on this. I mean, but you looked into one of the oof, more complex, deep topics that I think you could find. I mean, what, what, what intrigued you to do that or what, what pushed you to that? Well, maybe our next podcast will be on Star Wars because we could discuss that too. No, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I didn't know if I ever got into Star Wars, but um, no, what, what got me into it actually, I, I met, um, this is when I was going to the indult um, masses. I met a gentleman who was a third order um, Franciscan with the Franciscans of the Immaculate. They're that order that was crushed by Bergoglio as soon as he came in. He took the name of St. Francis and then he immediately stomp, stomped on the traditional Franciscans. So. Sounds about right. But anyway... This gentleman uh, gave me a book on this subject, and it just fascinated me, and it, it helped me to fall in love with Christ. Right? The Franciscans are known, St. Francis is known as being the most Christ-like saint. Right? That's in his canonization. That's why he was given the stigmata. There was, no one ever had that before him. And so he, he reflected Christ so perfectly that it said, St. Bonaventure said that when he went into heaven, the angels had a dispute. They said, I think that's St. Francis. No, that's not St. Francis. That's Christ, they, they, he, because he was so Christ-like. And so... This, this love for Christ is very important to the order, and it helped um, help me to, to develop that. But I guess um, I guess when I say nerdiness, like you know, in my past, I wasn't always uh, uh, I wasn't always even Catholic. I was you know an atheist for a long time. So that's a whole other story. But um, 
so my nerdiness has applied to different things in the past, but this particular one, it just, I, I, I don't know, I guess it just piqued my interest. It, uh, it explains so much. It, um, because maybe, maybe that has to do with it, that I was an atheist. Because for me, I had, to re I had to come to this conclusion that, no, these things must have been created. And this explains why they were created, right? Like, why, why do all these things exist? Well, God wants to communicate himself. He wants to pour his goodness out. But he does that fully in Christ. And so this, it's, just, it's just profound. And, um, <laughs> that's all I can interesting. Say. No, 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 I appreciate it. That, that's a really interesting thing going from being an atheist, as you say, and then looking for, okay, why? The, the why of it. That, that, yeah. Fascinating. All right. Well, I guess I'll, I'll let you finish with a conclusion. Okay. So in conclusion, um, in the doctrine of the absolute primacy of Christ, we give to Christ the King the greatest possible honor and glory attributing to him the first place in the order of creation and viewing all else only in light of Christ. We can give a new and deeper meaning to the priest's words at Mass. Through him, with him, and in him, be unto thee, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Jesus Christ, then, is not only the reason for the season, but the reason that seasons exist, the reason that all things exist. And just as the human eye observes the sun going around the earth, when in fact it's the earth that orbits the sun, so our dim eyes often view Christ as revolving around us, when in fact it is we who revolve around Christ, who truly draws all things unto himself. And so the, the last thing, uh, if, if you can pull up slide 15, I'd just like to end with the prayer to Christ the King, that wonderful prayer that uh, Father Chrysostom wrote. We can gain a plenary indulgence real quick. <laughs> all right, let me find it. Oh, boy. That's the one I'm not seeing. Let me see. Oh, here it is. Got it. Got it. Okay. Uh, I have to make that bigger because I don't have that written. Just one sec. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. O Christ Jesus, I acknowledge thee to be the King of the universe. All that has been made is created for thee. Exercise over me all thy sovereign rights. I hereby renew the promises of my baptism, renouncing Satan and all his works and pomps and I engage myself to lead henceforth a truly Christian life. And in an especial manner do I undertake to bring about the triumph of the rights of God and thy church so far as in me lies. Divine heart of Jesus, I offer thee my poor actions to obtain the acknowledgement by every heart of thy sacred kingly power. In such wise may the kingdom of thy peace be firmly established throughout all the earth. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for having me. This was a, a real a real pleasure. And for me, it's been a long time coming wanting to speak uh, about this. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity. And I hope that people get something out of it. So, Well, I, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate the, the, the very obvious amount of work you've put into this. I appreciate you sending slides and stuff. I really appreciate that you can tell that there's been a lot of thought and effort put into this. That, again, as you said at the beginning, it's, it's all for the glory of God. And, and it's, that's something that I think, maybe is the greatest lesson of all of this is that everything we do every day, right? That's, that's the lesson, right? Everything we that's do it. at every moment should be for the glory of God, easier said than done, but it is actually very simple. It's not easy, but it is very simple. And that's, as you yes. said, again, God is simple and our way to him is also simple, though not easy. So Daniel, I greatly appreciate it. I hope they'll have you on again sometime to, to maybe go into deeper uh, detail about this maybe we'll talk about your your conversion from atheism to to talking, to, to talking about it that, that that really interests me now i think that that's a, that's a fascinating uh, you know glimpse again of of the why you know why well, why and i think that's a beautiful thing i think that's what i talked all the time about you know how more people are going to find the truth if they you know all they have to do is ask the why you know what, what why are yeah. we here what and actually ask it really actually want the truth what what what's the point why are we here? Why, why did God create this? Or that, 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 that's a beautiful, beautiful thing, I think, to, to ponder as well. Daniel, thank you very much. Everyone, please like, share, subscribe, comment, and all of those different things. And, and really do share this one. I think this is going to be one that, that will really give people food for thought and, and hopefully, um, yeah, inspire them to do more research and to, well, to love and honor God. Daniel, until next time, God bless you. God bless. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider supporting the Franciscan Friars in Brazil. They are 20 strong now, and not only do they continue the great work of St. Francis by missionary activity and the observance of his holy rule, but they are also preserving the great tradition of Franciscan philosophy and theology, such as the doctrine discussed today. With the ravages of the Second Vatican Council, much of the theological richness of the Church has been obscured due to the collapse of religious orders. 
The brothers are working hard to preserve and nourish the unique flower that is Franciscanism within the Garden of Christ Church. Due to, due to the general poverty of Brazil and the yet stricter poverty of the order, our American dollars can stretch very far indeed. A link to donate via PayPal can be found in the show notes. Whether you can donate or not, please keep the Franciscans in your prayers. God bless.